Good evening, everybody. This is Deanna Minnick, and I'd like to welcome you to our third series in a series of four webinars on nutrition and cancer. And this evening, we're going to be talking about the top 10 foods to eat and the top 10 foods to avoid. So just for those of you who have not been on the call before, uh, just to let you know that there are options for you to ask questions. You can either write in via the chat function or you can use the mouse or use your computer to um, essentially hit the raise hand button and from that I'll know that you have a question and, and hope to answer it. So the way that we've been doing this is to um, allow for a bit of lecture, so about 20 minutes of lecture, and then to break for about 10 minutes and, and to offer a space in case anybody has some questions, comments, and we want to create some dialogue, and then to go back into another 20 minutes of lecture, followed again by 10 minutes of questions and answers and, and discussion. So what I will do is um, break at about 6.20, and no matter where we are in the presentation, I'll just take a, a quick break and see where we're at and see if people have questions. Um, because, again, uh, Harmony Hill does this in service of all of you, so we want to be sure that we are getting questions answered and addressed. All of the sessions are recorded, so if you happen to miss this or that you feel like the material is going too fast, uh, feel free to download the recording via the Harmony Hill website. And so we have that in uh, video as well as audio formats. So uh, normally we have Elaine Holland, the Executive Director of Harmony Hill Retreat Center, on the call to introduce me, but she has participated today in a Seattle marathon for uh, the benefit of Harmony Hill. So she uh, just heard from Victrina that she finished the race today, and so um, definitely had good thoughts about her and uh, glad that we had a little bit of sun to, to keep her uh, keep her spirits high as she was she was running the race. So I uh, just wanted to acknowledge Elaine and also to thank her for the coordination of these webinars. All right, so um, let's start and, and dive right in. Uh, again, this is our, our third webinar, and tonight um, we're going to have a lot of fun, actually, and there is a lot of material in this webinar. I guess out of, you know, all of them have a lot of material, and sometimes I might tend to go a little bit faster. Um, but again, I try to summarize some of the more salient points after the webinar in a newsletter format that you'll see coming through in your email inbox from Food and Spirit. So if you feel like if it's overwhelming, if you want to catch, catch some of the, um, the more important pieces that I'm going to be sending through in a newsletter. So the top, the yin and the yang here. And uh, just again, as with all webinars that we, we put on through Harmony Hill, this is for information and education purposes only. And what you're going to notice in this webinar is I'll be talking about a lot of different foods to eat and foods to avoid. But of course, I need to let you know that everybody is so different in their biochemistry and their physiology. And if you're going through cancer treatment or uh, any type of therapy, you definitely do want to check in with your physician. There are some foods that I'll be recommending, but of course that's on an individual basis. And so I would strongly encourage you to talk with your physician or healthcare practitioner before implementing anything that you hear about tonight. All right, so here's the overview of where we're going to be tonight. Uh, we're going to talk very briefly just to launch us into the discussion about the principle of food as medicine, very powerful concept. And then we are going to go through, believe it or not, 10 different foods. And it's not that these are the only foods. It was pretty hard to select which foods to talk about um, as being very healthful because there are numerous foods. So I had to be pretty selective. And I, I chose these foods in particular um, with good reason, and you'll see that as we go through. But it's not to say that there aren't many, many other healing foods because there certainly are. And we'll talk about these these 10 different foods that I've selected and how they support the five main pathways of health that we've been talking about in the webinars previously. We'll also uh, talk about the 10 foods to avoid, and I think it's just as important to realize what to eat and also what not to eat. Sometimes it's helpful psychologically to think about what we can add into our way of eating rather to, than to think about what we omit. 
So it's not to say that um, you've got to follow all of the advice here, but, you know, this is all for you to, to again, take in, process with your practitioner, and see what feels good for you. All right, so to start us off, what I thought I'd um, have on the one of the first um, discussion points here is to talk about basically looking at health as a, a tree. I think it's um, a great analogy. A lot of different institutes, like the Institute for Functional Medicine, uses this, this analogy. And if you think of uh, a tree exhibiting all of its beauty and splendor um, with branches and flowers and leaves and being fed through the roots, really what we're looking at when we're looking at the roots are the different components that make up health. So many times that's where food as medicine comes into play because it's one of the tendrils underneath the surface that really feeds us and really does create the phenotype of our, our structure, what we appear like, how we act, how we behave, how we think. Um, and of course, this webinar series is really focused on food and nutrition, but there are so many different aspects that we're not covering that are also, I would say, of equal importance. So everything from physical activity, your environment. We did talk about toxicity in the last webinar. Sleep is so essential. Um, how we maintain balance and that psychological balance and how we transform stress in our lives, as well as how do we connect to social networks. Uh, so, the, again, the one that we're mostly focusing on is food. And if you think of the quote from Hippocrates, one of the first physicians ever, um, some of his wisdom was to let food be your medicine and medicine be your food. And maybe one day we have, instead of pharmacies with a PH, um, we have pharmacies spelled F-A-R-M-A-C-Y to really get at the whole aspect of the farm and looking at food as being medicinal, that we are in every bite that we take, as Adele Davis would say, we are either creating health or we're promoting illness. So lifestyle is, is really medicine uh, in action as well. And again, speaking to the tree and all of the roots of the tree, um, being that we are mainly covering food in this webinar series, but really lifestyle is the much broader umbrella. And if you think of the story, um, there was a blog that was produced um, on, in fact, I believe my, my friend Wendy Alfaro, who is on the call, sent me this, this wonderful blog. Uh, and the title of the blog was, The Island Where People Forget to Die. Uh, it was at the end of October, and essentially it was put out by Dan Butner, who wrote the book, The Blue Zones, talking about people that have longevity. And he told the story in this blog of this man by the name of Stamatis Moriaitis. Uh, this man who came over to the United States, he was originally from an island in Greece, and came over to the United States after the Second World War and essentially planted his roots here. He married a Greek-American woman. He had three children. And so he came over when he was 35 and lived on the East Coast, lived in Florida. And at the age of 65, he was diagnosed with lung cancer. So he, the, the doctor didn't give him a very good prognosis. Basically, he had nine months to live. So he thought, well, I, I think I'm going to go back to Icaria, the island uh, in Greece where he was from. So he did go back, and he spent time with his community, his friends from long ago. He um, relaxed. He was with his friends. He drank red wine into the night, played dominoes ab uh, up until midnight, and and, and really, nine months came and gone. Uh, it, it just went. And so here, uh, you know, in general, uh, what, what Dan Buettner was talking about in this blog was about how he is now 97 years old and living a very robust life, um, and partly, probably, uh, because of his lifestyle, just letting go of some of the toxicities that he was probably confronted with um, with his very busy, stress-filled life in the United States and, and really went into the mode of relaxation and much more balance in his life. So the reason I mention this is because we hear about 
food is medicine a lot. We even hear about the benefits of lifestyle. But for some reason, people don't always feel the call to action. So I think if you have some role models or some people that you can look to as examples of where they've lived out that message, it becomes much more compelling. So if you look at what the Icarians eat, um, this uh, well, a photo was also included in the blog, and so you can go to the blog and take a look at that if you want. But essentially, um, they have healthy oils like olive oil, whole grains that they are milling by hand, essentially, and making into flour. They have lots of colorful whole fruits and vegetables as well as uh, dried herbs and spices. In fact, that's one of the things that we are going to talk about um, this evening as one of the foods that is really essential. So another example I'd like to share with you is um, this is a physician, Dr. Terry Walls. And this is you know, not uh, you know, somebody that is technically a, a patient or um, a person, but really somebody who knew a lot about medicine in the way of um, seeking answers, seeking solutions to her own health problem, which was at the time multiple sclerosis. So Dr. Walls uh, essentially was in a wheelchair, um, not being very well mobilized uh, through her condition. And at one point she describes that she was 180 degrees, basically lying flat in her wheelchair and unable to move with, with any type of um, uh, ease. So what she decided to do is, uh, being a medical doctor and really looking for different solutions, um, dove into the literature, got a lot of different opinions from different people, but essentially found that the best medicine for her was food. So one year um, after um, kind of the, this whole intensive process of being debilitated through multiple sclerosis, she essentially catapulted in this, into this whole mindset about food as medicine. So she began eating lots of fresh foods. Um, I've seen her talk in person, and she talks a lot about um, vegetables, um, alkaline vegetables, um, more or less a, a paleo approach with, with certain organic meats and also um, organic vegetables. And essentially she had a major turnaround within one year's time of implementing the food as medicine approach. So she has a great website, www.terrywalls.com, T-E-R-R-Y-W-A-H-L-S.com. Uh, really a beacon of truth, really living the message of lifestyle medicine. And in fact, now she's an inspirational speaker about that topic and uh, tells people about her own process and She's quite healthy. Um, I, I tend to see her uh, now and then at different conferences, different medical conferences. And in fact, I just ran into her at the last medical conference I was at uh, in the gym room. So she's she's very active. So, you know, to me, this really feels good to see that people are living that message. One other point I'd like to address um, is that food is more than medicine. I think that the word medicine takes on kind of a, a cold, um, it's not really a warm and fuzzy term. So I, I, I also believe, what I'd like to add to it, and in fact this might be my mantra, is that food is connection. Food is connection to our bodies, to our minds, to our spirits, and also to the environment and to the planet. So, and it's also connection to other people. So if we can keep it within that context, because I think, you know, if we put ourselves within that analysis paralysis thinking of food only supplying nutrients, we kind of miss the other dimensions of food that are so incredibly beneficial and healing just in their own right. So the connection we have with people while we're eating, acknowledging the the presence of of um, different components coming from different aspects of nature can all be very therapeutic. So just to bring back some of the information from our previous webinars, um, we did talk very early on in the first webinar about a book called Five to Thrive by Dr. Lise Allshuler and Carolyn Gazella. And they talked about um, the five pathways that are part of a cancer prevention strategy. So as we go through the different foods, what I'd like you to be thinking about is how are these foods addressing these five major pathways, which are the immune system, 
looking at balancing inflammatory pathways in the body, balancing hormones, looking at insulin resistance, and then finally focusing on digestion and detoxification. If you're interested in more of the work on detoxification, definitely uh, go back to the week two webinar where we talk a lot about um, toxicity and what you can do there. So I guess the question we're posing in this webinar, and in, in, in every question um, or in every webinar, we're, we're getting some question answered on a global basis. And in this one, it's much more about what are f the foods that are healing and what are the the foods that are not healing. So let's let's talk about that. So the top ten foods to have in the kitchen. And again, a disclaimer of keep your own physiology in mind. These may not be foods that you need to eat. In fact, keep in mind that um, even though I'll be talking about fruits and vegetables and um, different things, but, you know, things that we would all probably consider to be very healthful, you could still have allergies or sensitivities to these food foods. In fact, I remember some years ago um, being out with a friend and uh, him telling me about how he was sensitive to lettuce. Now, you would think that lettuce is a very healthful food, and now, in retrospect, I'm thinking he might have been sensitive to the sulfites or the different ways that lettuce is prepared in restaurants, but you just never know what you might be sensitive to. So we have that in mind as we go through these different foods. So uh, number one on the list, and what I'm going to do is tell you the food, tell you why it's important uh, from a health perspective, and then tell you how to get it and how much. So we'll we'll go through these um, individually. So the crucifers I talked a lot about when I talked about the detoxification pathways. So there's broccoli and Brussels sprouts, and, and usually people think of broccoli when they think of cruciferous vegetables. Um, but on the whole, it's really a much broader category of different foods. So things like parsnips and watercress and bok choy and collard greens and mustard greens, these are all part of the cruciferous family. Um, and what these vegetables tend to have in common is the predominance of sulfur as a main compound. And sulfur is very good for detoxification in the body. So it's not that everything has to be stinky, sulfur smelling, but um, typically that is what you might get if you're cooking these cruciferous vegetables. So why? What is so special? Well, since this is part of a cancer program, it's, it's worthwhile to look at which of these foods are anti-cancer, have chemopreventative properties. Cruciferous vegetables are definitely at the top of the list. And as I spoke about last week, they have a nice role in activating a lot of our liver's ability to detoxify. They're also seen as anti-inflammatory and a good source of different vitamins, minerals, and fiber. You'd be surprised what vitamins, in fact, I'll show a very um, small graph of the different vitamins that you find in cruciferous vegetables. And also, you may not think about this, but of course there's a lot of buzz about omega-3 fats, and the crucifers are a source of plant-based omega-3s. Um, now, keep in mind, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this when I talk about fish, but if you're getting your omega-3s from plants, just note that it's going to take your body more of a conversion to the active omega-3s. So the body has about a 5 to 22% conversion rate of those plant-based omega-3s to the active form. So if you're vegan or vegetarian, you really want to ensure that you're getting more of these healthful omega-3s, um, that you get a greater quantity so that it ensures a better conversion and a better quantity of the longer chain omega-3s. We'll talk more about that. But one cup of broccoli gives you about 200 milligrams of plant-based omega-3s. One cup of Brussels sprouts, about 260 milligrams. So if you keep in mind that the American um, Heart Association recommends about a gram a day for normal, healthy people, um, you know, you're looking at about one-fifth of, uh, of what you need per day from broccoli or Brussels sprouts. And also, this is really fascinating, um, in a study funded by the National Cancer Institute, it was a smaller study, but it, it found something pretty dramatic, and that was that when these people were eating one to two cups of cruciferous vegetables every day for three weeks, 
the level of oxidative stress in their bodies dropped by 22%, dropped by about a fifth, which is quite great because um, if you think of oxidation and oxidative stress being one of the factors that ties into inflammation, we definitely want to be reducing a lot of that oxidative stress. All right, so um, nutrients in broccoli, what do we have? So in one cup of raw broccoli, um, you have quite a bit of vitamin C. You have about 135% of the daily value. So keep in mind that daily value, that's based on a 2,000-calorie intake. You also have a lot of vitamin K, about 116%. So, and actually, I'm just looking at the time and realizing we're already at 620. So I think what I'm going to do um, very briefly at this point is open up the lines. Uh, if you do have any questions so far or comments, what I can do is unmute you. You can also type something to me via the chat function. So I'm just going to wait for about, ah, Karen has a question. Okay, so Karen, I'm going to unmute you. Okay, hi, Deanna. Hi, Karen, hi, Deanna. good evening. Hi. Um, I don't know if this is exactly on topic, but well, there, there, are many, um, there are many water treatments water filters, etc. And yes. today, um, I, I have a friend who's basically living by grace alone. He has Agent Orange and he's, he's on uh, constant uh, dialysis mm. and um, wouldn't be alive if he weren't getting dialysis and if he misses it. So mm -hmm. he has something called the Tersano Lotus System um, water treatment center, and also a sanitizer. It's a water filter that you plug in and then it adds an oxygen molecule and takes out all the toxins. And he also has, it looks like a salad, you know, those things that spin salads. And it, uh, it cleans fruits and vegetables to where there's 100% pretty much. Do you know anything oh, about that? You know, I have not heard of that specific water filter. It does sound like a, um, a heavy-duty one, and it's doing lots of different things. I haven't seen anything on the science. I haven't heard anything about um, the, the product in general. But I'm glad that you bring it up because it does tie into what we spoke about last week, especially when it comes to washing fruits and vegetables and ensuring healthy, good water supply. So thanks for bringing it up. I Sorry I can't comment further. I'm not familiar with the brand. But when we did talk about water filtration systems, we talked about how some of the under-the-counter, under-the-sink um, type of filtration systems tend to be much more effective at taking different contaminants out versus the, the pitcher style uh, of filtration. And I know well, some people that use even both. So... <laughs> But, yeah, this this sounds like a pretty deluxe system. I'd have to look into it to give you a, a much a much more sound opinion. Okay, thank you. It, it's, uh, it uses uh, the ozone, and it's uh, they're both small appliances, which surprised me. I just wondered if you knew, and I'll do some more research myself. Yeah, and, and please send it on, and I'd be happy to look at it. Absolutely. Okay, thanks. All right, thanks, Karen. Uh -huh. All right, anybody else? Um, Karen, I want to be sure I mute you there. Okay, there we go. All right, Victrina, I am going to unmute you. All right. Well, hello, Deanna. Hello. Um, I, had a quick, I had a quick question. When you're talking about, um, you know, foods, et cetera, that we should be eating, um, and like for the the broccoli and stuff, and you talk about one cup of raw. Um, how much in general does if we eat it cooked, is that going to affect these nutritional values that you're kind of mm. expressing on this slide right in front of us? Oh yeah, that's a very good question. In fact, I have a slide which speaks to how to prepare it, and and that's going to be coming up. But let me answer your question on the spot now, which is a very good one, and I'm sure it's going through a lot of people's minds. Uh, yes, when you're cooking fruits and vegetables, um, what you do is you, you tend to lose a lot of the water-soluble vitamins. So things like vitamin C, even though we see 
that uh, broccoli, raw broccoli, contains 135% of the daily value. Once you cook it, especially in water, um, that's where you're going to get a lot of leaching of, of a lot of these constituents. Now, that said, although you may be losing some things, you may also be gaining some things, um, incidentally. There are some things in the presence of heat that can become unlocked in a lot of that fibrous vegetable matter. So um, certain minerals may become more bioavailable. So the general rule of thumb here that I'm just going to apply and put out there for all of the, the different vegetables is basically a slight amount of steaming. So not completely raw, which can be hard for some people's digestive systems and may not liberate a lot of the different nutrients, unless you're a person that um, eats raw food and, and only raw food, then obviously you, you only have that option or choose that option. Um, on the other side of that, I would say, you know, obviously overcooking is not a good thing. So something in the middle there is what I have tended to see as being really effective for getting some of those nutrients, um, making it more digestible, and it really does – it's very in line with the principles of traditional medicine systems like Ayurveda or traditional Chinese medicine as well as even the science that's published on a lot of these these fruits and vegetables. So – Again, great question. Um, if you're steaming, make sure you're not l using a lot of water or that you're not losing a lot of the, the water from the vegetable itself because mm -hmm. that's the medium that you're going to lose a lot of the, the vitamin C and also the B vitamins. So, then so does that answer speaking, your question? Yes. Well, yeah. and then my, you sort of answered my second question, which was going to be, you know, what was your recommended preparation style for – uh, the vegetables, which sounds like light steaming, which is what I tend to yeah. do anyway because I don't yeah. like what boiling vegetables does to them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the thing with broccoli is if you overcook it, um, it just starts to get really stinky and it starts to lose its color. So my rule of thumb is look for when the, the vegetable or the fruit, if you're cooking the fruit, gets really bright. And with broccoli, that is so apparent. It becomes like a fluorescent green almost. Mm -hmm. It just gets really bright. It's like, yes, that's the time to eat the broccoli. And there's actually been a study on that at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Johanna Lampe's um, lab. She does a lot of research on broccoli and cruciferous vegetables. And she essentially found that one minute and 30 seconds was the ideal amount of time to liberate a lot of the enzymes, or at least the, the constituents in the broccoli that helped a lot of the detox enzymes in the body. So it wasn't overcooking and it wasn't raw. It was something in between. So, you know, the middle path is typically the one that's less extreme and you're, you're going to get some benefit on both sides. So that's what I would recommend. Fantastic. Thank you so much. All right. Sure. So I'll put you back on mute now. All right. Um, I'm going to dive back in. It's just uh, we just ended our, our Q&A there. We'll have some time at the end. But we've got uh, a ton more of information. In fact, I'm realizing that I better probably speed it up a little bit. <laughs> All right, so how should you eat uh, crucifers? Lots of different ways. Um, as I mentioned, don't overcook them. If convenience is an issue for you and you don't like to get the stalks, buy the ready-to-go in the frozen. And, yes, frozen is as good as fresh in many cases. So in many times what they're doing is they're, they're just blanching the fruit or the vegetable and then freezing it straight away. So it's almost like it seals in the nutrients and prevents a lot of the degradation. So yes to frozen, yes to fresh, no to things like canned, although you don't find canned broccoli and, and cauliflower and a lot of these other crucifers, so that's not really an issue. You can add them to raw veggie platters, especially good around social uh, events and the holidays. You can add raw broccoli or cauliflower florets to green salad to heighten the nutrient value. I like adding them. I like pureeing cruciferous vegetables personally and making soups out of them and stews, especially if you have a lot of leftover cruciferous vegetables. And when it comes to selecting them at the grocery store, look for broccoli that is firm. And it's almost like it's so green, it's purple. And I know that you know the kind of broccoli I'm talking about because it's almost, um, it's kind of this really dark, um, dark green. It's almost, it almost has like a bluish hue. And in fact, um, broccoli that looks like that tends to have more beta carotene and vitamin C. 
So you're actually getting more nutrients. You're getting a better bang for your buck at the grocery store versus if it started to turn yellow, if it's limp, if it's bendable, then it's it's getting old. So pureeing, um, adding to omelets, uh, I think that that's also omelets and, and egg dishes are a wonderful medium to get a lot of different vegetables in general. So what about the amount? So what the studies show is getting at least one and a half, one, one and a half cups two to three times per week. And in fact, um, if you want to amp that up a bit and really get the full benefit, getting two cups four to five times per week is probably optimal. So there's a minimal of one and a half cups of broccoli or cruciferous vegetables two to three times per week and amping that up to four to five times per week at two cups total. So um, just more on broccoli, um, keeping it in a plastic bag, removing the air because the air leads to the degradation of the broccoli, storing in the – usually it keeps for about up to 10 days. Don't wa- – now, if you've been on a webinar that I've given before, many times what I'll say is wash vegetables and fruits before they go into your refrigerator. But in this case, you can get broccoli kind of soggy, and it doesn't work. It can, it can actually go bad much sooner Uh, if you do that. So don't wash before you store it. And place the broccoli uh, florets or the the heads of broccoli into well-sealed containers so that it can keep for a longer period of time. The vitamin C, once you've exposed the broccoli and cut into it, it starts to degrade. So it's best to use broccoli that has been cut into within a couple of days if you can. Um, If it's blanched or frozen, let's just say you've got some excess broccoli from your garden from the summer, it can stay up to a year in the freezer. And um, again, leftover cooked broccoli, I don't think it's optimal to keep that around too long. You're going to start to see a color change, but for the most part, it may keep for a few days. And sometimes what you can do is just squeeze lemon juice over it so that it um, it's more preserved um, also on the outside. So there are lots of different uh, crucifers, and we talked about those in depth during the detox webinar. So collard greens, which I like, um, they're almost like a tortilla. You can use them to wrap different vegetables or rice or meat or whatever you choose um, within that. Kale is like the magic vegetable in my mind. It's very alkalizing. You can do a lot with kale, making kale smoothies. We did that at Harmony Hill over the summer. Um, Bok choy is great for stir fries. There are also a lot of different Asian green vegetables that are interesting to work with. So if you live near a market like Central Market, like Whole Foods, where they have a more deluxe variety of different vegetables, I would say just trying some of these out um, might be really interesting, and you might find it very surprising how much you like them. Um, A lot of the bitter greens, like arugula, are also great for the liver and um, just in general for metabolism. And along the same lines, watercress and radishes fall into that bucket as well. All right, so um, again, I better speed it up a little bit here because we spent a lot of time on broccoli. But I always say that if I was on a desert island, broccoli would be one of the foods I'd want to be stranded with if I knew I had to survive. Now, the other thing, um, number two here I listed as green tea. I know it's not a food, but technically um, it starts out as a plant and we create it into a beverage. But I- I'm still going to lump it in here as one of the top ten foods because it is so phenomenal in its impact. It's a great source of antioxidants, lots of um, great studies in cells and in animals showing that it's anti-cancer. It may also, now this is really interesting, it may be beneficial for helping uh, your bones to stay healthy, for bone mineral density. There are some newer studies coming out on green tea about the catechins in green tea being beneficial for bone. It may also, I mentioned green tea last week when I talked about the liver and detox. It may help to activate both sets of detoxification enzymes in a beneficial way. It may help promote healthy metabolism and also healthy lipids, which is why I think it's great to drink green tea after a meal, especially um, a meal that maybe you feel wasn't so healthful. 
I was just in Taiwan uh, a couple weekends ago, and it's really fascinating because they have so many different types of teas, and they drink different teas after different meals for different health benefits. And I thought that that was really interesting. You know, we think of red wine, white wine um, with a meal for certain palate reasons, but how often do we think of using a beverage with a meal to help us with the medicinal aspects and and what we're taking in and and creating a synergistic effect? Um, Green tea may also have some healthy benefits for our blood sugar, which is great. And so in general, um, what the studies show is that green tea drinkers appear to have a lower risk for a wide range of diseases, so from simple bacterial or viral infections all the way to chronic degenerative conditions. And one of the ones I didn't list here per se, but even periodontal disease. And your gum health tells so much about your internal health. In fact, I I think that the mouth is like a a microcosm of your larger macrocosm. There's a, a, a nice association that we're starting to see now in the medical literature between gum health and cardiovascular disease. So lots of good things here with green tea. How do you consume it and how much? Um, Typically about three cups a day is what has been used in studies and also based on typical intake in Asian populations. Black pepper can help to increase some of the, um, the, well, the more potent antioxidant that's in green tea. So if you have a meal, let's imagine a fresh green salad with fresh ground black pepper on it, having some green tea is is creating lots of food synergy there. Loose tea, if you buy it loose, that's usually my preference. Um, I like the loose tea because you can reuse it um, and you just want to kind of crush the leaves a little bit just to be sure that it has a, a good aroma. And if you're purchasing it in smaller amounts, then you know that you have just the amount that you need for freshness rather than buying large amounts that are going to just degrade over time faster. Much like oil, uh, you want to protect it from light, moisture, and food odors because it will take that on. And Karen, to your question about water, when it comes to making tea, um, it's better to use spring water and followed by filtered water not distilled water because distilled water basically has everything taken out of it, including minerals. And some of those minerals are essential to bringing out the tea's flavor. And also it it doesn't hurt to have some of those um, good minerals. Now, I must say I'm more of an intuitive person in the kitchen, so I don't use food scales and things like that. And even recipes, I just, <laughs> just kind of go with it, what feels right. But if you are into wanting the exact measure, using a food scale is probably a good idea with tea, especially if you're using loose tea, of course. So using about three grams of tea for five ounces of water, um, four grams of tea to eight ounces of water. And for brew time, it kind of depends on the tea, and usually 30 seconds to one minute is ideal for most teas. However, some of the more uh, exquisite, um, kind of the the more fine teas, the green teas, require a longer steeping. And I always think that longer steeping is better because the the more bitter it is, the more medicinal it is uh, in the way of the catechin content. So something like six to seven minutes is is a nice time frame as well. Um, Also, there are many different things that you can do with green tea to be really creative. Everything from putting in some thinly sliced ginger and lemon, some sprigs of spearmint. Um, They have green tea chai, and either you can make it on your own. They also have tea bags that are kind of a black and green chai blend. I, I'm a real big fan of, of chai tea, making it yourself, um, not getting the kind that's already in a mix that has lots of sugar, but the kind that you make with a tea bag, you use coconut milk, you add in some additional spices, very medicinal. So lots of different things that you can do um, with green tea. You can even um, cook udon noodles um, in green tea for about five minutes. It kind of leaves this infusion of green tea in the noodles and gives you a little bit of of medicinal benefit as well, although I must admit with the, the presence of, of heat and probably you're, you're not getting so much steeped into the noodle, but at least it's it's something and it doesn't it's not a huge time requirement. 
Some people worry about the caffeine content of green tea, um, in which case I would strongly recommend the decaffeinated versions of green tea. But um, essentially, green tea contains about half of what you would find in coffee. Lots of variety there. It's not always um, standard that it's, it's specifically half. It kind of depends on the strength of the green tea. But on the whole, rule of thumb is that it's about half of what you get in coffee. And just to comment really briefly on coffee, most of the studies focus on intakes above 200 milligrams as having a problematic effect. So that would be about four cups of green tea a day if it was caffeinated on average. So the general recommendation, again, is about three cups. Now keep in mind that not everybody has the same sensitivity to caffeine. Um, you might be a little bit more sensitive, and if you are and you don't want caffeine, then choosing a decaffeinated green tea is, is a good choice. Or what you can do is use a caffeinated green tea bag and steep it and then pour off the liquid from that first infusion because 80% of the caffeine is released in that first brew. So just reusing the tea bag or um, using the, the loose tea again. There are some really interesting things about um, green tea. Two, I already mentioned the catechins, which are the antioxidants. Um, also, green tea contains an amino acid, which I mean, amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. So it's, it might sound kind of strange that there's a, a protein or an amino acid in green tea, but it's called L-theanine. And L-theanine helps to give people that sense of restful alertness, if that makes sense. So in other words, the caffeine is kind of stimulatory, but L-theanine, um, this compound, has kind of this more restful sensation in the body. In fact, um, it's so popular that they even have dietary supplements that contain L-theanine in isolation. So L-theanine helps to stimulate the production of alpha brain waves, which calms the body, but also makes you pretty alert. Okay, food number three, olive oil. I don't think I need to sell you on olive oil. <laughs> there are so many good things that you probably hear um, in the press. It's anti-inflammatory. It's anti-cancer. In fact, the studies show that as little as one to two tablespoons of olive oil per day can lower the risk of certain cancer types, uh, including cancers of the breast, respiratory tract, upper digestive tract, and to a lesser extent, the lower digestive tract, so colorectal cancers. So it may also help promote cardiovascular health. Um, in terms of the how, when we talk about oil, making sure that you keep that oil away from heat, light, and oxygen. So keeping it in dark tinted bottles. Um, I prefer the extra virgin, unfiltered, unrefined oil. So in other words, um, a cloudy oil, um, which would have more of those olive polyphenols. Typically, um, if you use it within one to two months, you will have a healthy composition of the oil. But um, after two months, what studies show is that you start to get a, uh, a decline in the, the number of different nutritional components. Also, um, in fact, if you look at the storage over 12 months, there was another study that found that virtually all the, the different important antioxidants had uh, dramatically reduced, even when you controlled the circumstances. So um, vitamin E dropped by 100%. There was essentially no vitamin E after one year of storage. Beta carotene dropped by 40%, and chlorophyll, what makes it a little bit green, um, dropped by as much as 30%. So you, you definitely, um, the, all the, the polyphenols and such, which give it its flavor and its medicinal impact, really start to degrade after just a couple of, of months. Um, there was also another study which looked at, um, lo at the different types of, of olive oil and um, storing it in the, in the light or in the dark for 12 months, and oil stored in the clear bottles under supermarket lighting lost at least 30% of their vitamin E and carotenoids. So look at where it's being stored, even in the grocery store, if that's where you buy it from. Um, is it in the light? Is it in a dark glass um, container? That's really what you do want. All right, fantastic. So number four is garlic. 
So this is all starting to sound pretty Mediterranean. <laughs> so it's a good source of selenium, and selenium is a great anti-cancer uh, mineral. It may also help promote healthy lipids, things like cholesterol and triglycerides. Uh, definitely thought to be anti-inflammatory, antiviral, antibacterial, antifungal, uh, you name it. Um, anti-cancer uh, may help in iron metabolism. It may help your body to utilize iron better. So how do you eat it? Well, um, I prefer fresh, but there are also flake, powder, and paste forms for people that uh, want more of the convenience factor. You will get some benefit from them. But if you buy it fresh, you want to be sure that it's plump, it's not um, dried out, and it, it has um, intact skin. So you don't want squishy um, cloves of garlic. You want to be sure that it's not damp. And when it comes to how much, if you can get at least one serving of an allium vegetable, and that includes onions as much as garlic, um, typically about at least half a clove in your individual food portion. So if you're making a recipe, recommending um, using at least one to two cloves. The size of the garlic bulb itself is not an indication of quality. And there are so many different varieties of garlic, actually, once you start to get into it. So they're all a little bit different. But if depending on its age and variety, um, the whole bulb will, will typically keep fresh for about a month if it's stored properly. So again, you want to keep it out of the heat, out of the light, and out of moisture conditions. Now, here's something you may or may not know. When you chop or you crush a garlic um, clove, you are essentially maximizing the production of one of the most healthful compounds in garlic called allicin, A-L-L-I-C-I-N. And if you wait for about five minutes before you start eating it or cooking it, you will um, basically maximize the production of that compound. So after the five minutes, after you've crushed the garlic clove, then tossing it into the meal. So too much heat for too long is really going to reduce the activity. So if you can let it sit out uh, for about five to ten minutes after you've crushed it, um, that's ideal. And you don't want to overheat garlic either because it's going to make it bitter and um, it, again, the healthful components will start to decay. So cooking about 5 to 15 minutes, so maybe tossing it in towards the end of a stir fry. Okay, number five is beans, and um, I'm specifying there are so many beans, so I'm just going to address black beans. Um, black beans are a wonderful source of antioxidants and anti-inflammatory phytochemicals. In fact, even the black beans color, the black color, is because of some of these plant compounds called anthocyanins. So they're just loaded with different plant compounds. They're full of fiber. They um, may help with blood sugar regulation, help with the kind of the slow release of sugar into the bloodstream. Um, Anti-cancer food as well, at least what we see in cell and animal models, looks very promising. All right, so how do you eat beans? Lots of good um, recent information that is coming out now. Um, what you want to do, at least this is my recommendation, is to soak the beans. And by doing so, you get rid of some of the things that bind up a lot of those phytonutrients, things like the phytates and things like the tannins, and also things that can give you gas, like a lot of the, the starchy components. So when you soak um, beans, you can remove up to about a third of the, the starchy components just by, uh, by soaking them and then not reusing the water. You know, there's been kind of a debate, do you use the water, do you not? I would say not um, because, again, you're getting rid of a lot of these more undesirable components. In terms of the amount, um, about three cups per week has been recommended by various health opinion leader organizations. That's if you're eating about 2,000 calories. And one serving is, of legumes is defined as half a cup of cooked beans. So um, what we're looking at is about then three cups per week on average. Now, if you're eating canned beans, you do want to note that a lot of the, the canned linings are, um, they, they have bisphenol A. So, um, in fact, there was a study that the Environmental Working Group did that found 
that um, about half of all the canned foods that they tested contained BPA. Uh, there's only one company I know for sure that does not have BPA in the can linings, and a lot of other food manufacturers are starting to change their process. But Eden Foods, E-D-E-N, has a line of beans and, and other canned products um, where they definitely focus on BPA-free. And the can should state that it's BPA-free. If it is, you can assume, or what you can do is you can always call the food manufacturer. Um, so lots of different ways to eat the beans. You don't have to get them from a can. It's a lot easier sometimes, but you can just get the dried beans. Um, they store for up to a year in an airtight container, as long as it's not subject to heat, light, and too much oxygen and moisture. And with dried beans, what you want to do is just look at the beans, make sure you remove any stones, debris, any damaged beans, and then rinse them under cool running water. You can pre-soak them um, in order to make them more digestible and to shorten their cooking time. A couple of different ways to do that. Um, one way is to boil the beans in a saucepan for about two minutes. Take the pan off the heat. You can cover it and allow it to stand for two hours. Or if you're thinking about having beans the next day before you go to bed, put them in some warm water um, initially. Uh, and you can put them into the refrigerator for the night, so six to eight hours, letting them soak a bit, and then rinsing them off, getting rid of that water that they were soaking in in the morning. All right. Um, now, beans in general may not be for everybody. They do contain purines, which purines are in our body. They're in animals. They're in plants. It's a compound that some people in high amounts um, that are susceptible to gout flare-ups um, should minimize. So black beans do contain purines. If we look at the nutrition of black beans, just in one cup of cooked um, black beans, it's just amazing how much fiber you get. You get about 15 grams of fiber, and that's more than the average American gets in one whole day. So if you're getting um, this one cup of black beans a day, you're really getting a lot of fiber and some other nutrition um, as well, some of the B vitamins, some of the other minerals. Okay, number six, tomatoes. Why tomatoes? Um, lots of great compounds here, antioxidants, anti-inflammatory compounds, things like lycopene, uh, vitamin C, and beta carotene. They may help promote better heart health. Um, Anti-cancer, especially, it seems to be a correlation with prostate cancer and um, reducing risk with greater tomato consumption. So how do you eat them? All tomatoes don't have to be deep red in order to get the benefit of a lot of the compounds. In fact, some of the more recent studies are showing that orange-colored tomatoes um, are also beneficial that um, there are other compounds in those tomatoes which can help with lycopene absorption. If you are sensitive to nightshades, to the family of nightshade plants, you want to avoid tomatoes. It's part of the, that nightshade family. When you're selecting tomatoes, make sure that they don't have wrinkles or cracks or bruises or soft spots. And there was a recent study that showed that there are certain varieties that are higher in antioxidants. So things like New Girl, Jetstar, Fantastic, and First Lady. I love these names. They're hilarious. Um, but they, they tend to be higher in these, these antioxidants. And if you're buying canned tomatoes, really watch out there because being that they're acidic, they tend to liberate more things in the can. So um, for some um, cans that are from foreign countries, they, they may not have the strict regulations around lead, in the cans, and so you might get some interaction between the acid and lead and also acid and the BPA. So you definitely want to be sure that you are contacting the food manufacturer to find out if they use BPA-free cans um, if you are buying toma canned tomatoes. And if you are cooking um, tomatoes, you want to make sure that you're cooking in cookware that is supportive of good healthy compounds, so not using aluminum cookware, which again, it might be liberated in the presence of the stomach or the uh, tomato acid. So one cup of raw tomatoes is again, chock full of different nu nutrients. Um, 
really high in things like vitamin A because of the beta carotene, vitamin K, which is, um, I think, a vitamin that doesn't get talked about enough, but it has lots of good effects, as well as vitamin C. All right, number seven, blueberries. Why? Um, well, it's a brain food, and many people are experiencing, as they get older, cognitive decline, and 65% of people are afraid of losing their, their memory and their mental acuity. So in one recent study, they had adults drinking about two and a half cups of blueberry juice a day for 12 weeks and found that they had better cognition and memory compared to before the study started. Now, I'm not a big fan of juice uh, because I, you know, you're bringing in lots of, of sugar, but if it's the only way that you'll get some blueberry, um, it might be a good strategy. Blueberries on their own have a pretty moderate glycemic index. So um, they, in addition to being moderate to low glycemic index, they may also have a benefit on regulating blood sugar. So that's a good thing. They are superstars in the antioxidant kingdom of foods. And in fact, um, blueberry intake in the amount of one to two cups per day over the course of one to three months has been shown to have a lot of good effects for cardiovascular health. So helping to reduce a lot of the the blood lipids, the blood fats that are high. It may also help to reduce the oxidation of LDL cholesterol, and that's a big deal because that's one of the steps of atherosclerosis. It may also help support healthy blood pressure and also anti-cancer as shown in cell and animal studies. I could go on about blueberries. Um, in one cup, you get some pretty appreciable amounts of vitamin K and vitamin C, uh, in terms of how to eat them, if you can get berries, and I'm not even just saying blueberries, but all berries at least three to four times per week, that's preferred. Freezing is fine for blueberries, and the studies show that organically grown blueberries have significantly higher concentrations of antioxidants compared to conventionally grown. So um, just note that the blueberries should be firm. They shouldn't be soggy. You want to shake the container they're in to see if they move freely, to be sure that they're not soft, damaged, or moldy. Uh, and similarly, if you pick up a frozen container or a bag of blueberries, shake it to see whether or not they have been clumped together, which may indicate that they've been thawed and refrozen. So that's not optimal. You want to wash them right before eating. And um, if you want, if you have a lot of blueberries during the summer and you want to freeze them, you wash them, you drain them, and what you can do is put them out on a cookie sheet and place them in the freezer until they're frozen and then take them out. That's if you have enough room in your freezer. But then take them out and put the berries in a plastic bag for storage, and you can kind of break them up into smaller bags. Okay, we're almost there. Uh, number eight, citrus. Um, why, I'm going to stick with lemons. Of course, citrus is a large family, grapefruit, limes, oranges, but I, let's just talk about lemons. Um, I like lemons especially because they bring out the flavor of other foods, and they help to make meats more digestible. They're rich in vitamin C and bioflavonoids. They're antioxidants. They're anti-inflammatory. They also help to promote healthy liver detoxification. And there are lots of creative ways to incorporate them into your eating. Um, if you choose the fully ripened lemons and limes, that's when their antioxidant levels are their highest. And the thinner the skin, the more juicy they are and um, the more you're going to get out of them. And not only do you squeeze them for their juice, but you can use the lemon zest in recipes. And, and you can even freeze the lemon zest if you want to use it for recipes uh, to come. They should be bright yellow and no trace of the green. And if you can, keep them, again, out of light. Um, store them in the refrigerator crisper, and they can keep for, for several weeks in that way. You can, here's a really neat idea, I thought, and a lot of this information I'm taking from the website whfoods.com, really neat website. Uh, lots of great tidbits about foods, and I mentioned this website in our second webinar. But you can put freshly squeezed lemon juice in ice cube trays, freeze it, and then store them in plastic bags in the freezer. So just a nice way to get, you know, certain amounts of lemon juice. 
The lemon will produce more juice when it's warm, so you may want to run it under warm water. You might want to um, kind of create some friction in your with your hands to make it warmer, but you'll actually produce more from the fruit, which is interesting. Definitely wash the skin very well before cutting into it and making the zest because a lot of those pesticides hang out on the skin of citrus, especially citrus. They are heavily sprayed. And for those of you who may have issues with oxalates, you tend to find more oxalates in the skin. Use thinly sliced lemons to tenderize fish and poultry. You can make dressings by adding it um, to different oils, adding in garlic and pepper. I like squeezing it into water and um, giving a different flair to water. And just to mention lime briefly, squeezing lime juice onto an avocado is also really tasty. Okay, number nine, fish. Um, salmon. Salmon is wonderful um, because it contains omega-3s. And omega-3 fats are associated with decreased risks of a number of different cardiovascular issues, including heart attack, stroke, arrhythmia, high blood pressure, and even high triglycerides. So a lot of different opinion leader organizations are now talking about um, the, the benefits of omega-3s. So how much? Um, essentially about um, two to three times per week. And yes, I know we're going to have to wrap up pretty quickly here, and I'm going to plan to do that in, in five minutes. So if you can just go a little bit over, and then for those of you who want to stay on, I can take um, about five minutes worth of questions there. Okay, so about two to three times per week um, is, is great. And also when it comes to cancer, decreased risk for several types of cancer. So in the first webinar, we did talk about anti-inflammatory versus inflammatory fats. Please revisit that if you'd like to get some more information about how the omega-3 fats are beneficial for our health and how we keep the balance between omega-6 and omega-3. So um, I have, uh, you know, basically a list of different fish sources. Um, every About a serving, which is about the size of the palm of your hand, gives you about a, a pretty much an efficacious dose of the EPA and DHA omega-3 fats. We did talk about mercury in the last webinar, so there are certain types of um, fish that you want to focus on if you are trying to reduce the amount of mercury. You can also get some vitamin D from salmon. So four ounces of, of um, salmon can give you 265% of the daily value for vitamin D. How do you eat it? Well, let me just give you the takeaway here. Alaskan salmon, and for those of us who are in the Pacific Northwest, um, we have it made because we have more access to things like sockeye and coho and chinook and various other types of Alaskan caught salmon. Um, this is what the, the research shows um, as far as being lower in contaminants and also greater sustainability so you can feel good about eating it. Smell is a measure of freshness and also smoked salmon um, typically will contain polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are not very healthful. Um, if you're storing fish in the refrigerator, you may want to put it on a tray of ice. Usually fish likes a little bit colder than the, the standard refrigerator temperature. And to remove the skin when you cook it because you get a lot of toxins that store in the skin. All right, I'm just going to end with the herbs and spices. Um, gosh, we're going to do a whole webinar on herbs and spices. They have so many great activities. Um, and if you look at um, this graph very quickly, the, the countries that have the greatest spice production and use also have the lowest amount of cancer incidence. As you can see um, through India, India has lower rates of things like dementia and other chronic diseases and also has a lot of spice use. So turmeric, um, definitely an anti-cancer spice. Gosh, it, it does so many things as we see in cell models. In terms of how much, uh, in India, the average person gets about a teaspoon of turmeric a day, spread out over three meals. And of course, uh, for people that need supplemental curcumin, maybe they have more inflammation, um, it's best taken on an empty stomach about an hour before eating. And also with a little bit of grapefruit juice, pineapple juice, black pepper, oil, or dairy can help the absorption of turmeric. If you're buying it, um, you can buy it, buy it fresh. And um, 
but if you buy it dried, uh, you just want to be sure that you are using um, a, you know, a source that you don't keep for longer than about a year. You can add it to vegetables to make a stir fry, um, to even to fruits. You can add it to meat as a tenderizer, adding a teaspoon or two to meat and vegetable stews, adding it to fried onions, cruciferous vegetables. Now, that's a one-two punch, adding turmeric to broccoli. Oh, my goodness, that is one major anti-cancer food right there. Uh, the reason why mustard is yellow is because of turmeric. You can also add turmeric to scrambled eggs or tofu, using it in lentil soup and also in dips and salad dressing. You can blend it into melted butter. You can drizzle it over cooked vegetables. Um, kind of a nice, more of an Indian approach is to heat it in oil first and then add it to vegetables and rice. You could add it to chili, to stews, and don't uh, use it with dairy if you want the flavor to, to remain pretty strong. So I'll whiz through. I'm not even going to explain the top 10 foods to avoid, but essentially I think it'll be common sense. Um, number one, overcooked meats. Number two, we've talked a lot about sugar. Number three, artificial sweeteners. Oh, my goodness. We could do a whole session just on that. Number four, soft drinks. Number five, refined flour. Number six, high amounts of unsaturated, high inflammatory potential liquid oils, things like corn oil, soy oil um, that you use for cooking. Number seven, excessive alcohol. Number eight, excessive non-organic dairy products. Number nine, foods with trans fats. Make sure you read the labels. Look for partially hydrogenated oils on the label. And number 10, foods with preservatives, things like monosodium glutamate, nitrates, nitrites, sulfites, BHT, BHA. Some of my favorite dishes are um, making my own granola, adding in berries, having it with coconut milk, or even the coconut milk kefir that is now on the market. Um, including avocado into smoothies can also be pretty tasty. Salmon um, wraps with, um, with mustard or um, avocado on a rice tortilla or even a collard, collard green leaf. Um, my breakfast sometimes is salmon, rice, and kale. And uh, it's, it's very satisfying, actually. Uh, lentil soup is also another great one. So with that, um, we have gone a little bit over here. I apologize. Next time I'm going to do the five foods to eat, <laughs> the five foods to avoid, because there really is so much to say about each one. But I do want to um, open the, the space um, for anybody that has questions. So we'll just spend a couple of minutes. All right, so I am seeing, I think Karen has a question. Um, Karen, I'm going to unmute you. Okay, Karen, are you there? Yes. Hmm. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, loud and clear. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. What's your question? Okay, a couple of things I, I made note of. You said okay. I eat lox a lot for salmon, and you were saying yes. that's not health, not good. Well, lox, um, yeah, lox does have some benefit in the way of it being um, salmon that contains omega threes. Um, the debate is, you know, and again, it's just you know the highest choice, right? So, if you can get grilled, broiled salmon, that would be the best choice. Further down okay. that list, just one step, would be something like a smoked salmon or a lox. I don't think lox is terrible. In fact, I, I think it's a great substitute for people that can't do fresh. But you just have to note that in the smoking process or in the treating process of the salmon, you may get other compounds that form. So what I would say is, you know, keeping portions modest and also changing up the, um, the amount Right, so not always doing lox or smoked salmon, but getting in some some broiled or some some grilled salmon, or even boiled salmon or poached salmon, are also some good choices. Just making sure you get variety. Okay. Also. Okay. Yes, there's also something called uh, like para 
sweet potato chips and they're called and snap pea chips. Yeah. That are supposed that they say on the packaging it's like a, a serving of vegetable and it's the main yeah. ingredient but they have some oil that it's cooked in and that's but that's all. Yeah. And they're yeah. baked. Think about yeah, those. Yeah, so sweet potato chips. Yeah, so here's my general take on sweet potato chips, right? Um again Choosing the highest path, and so if you're really feeling inclined to do something like a crunchy, salty snack, and you're feeling like chips or wanting to bring something to a social gathering that would be acceptable for many people, I think a sweet potato chip is probably up higher on that list. Is it the best snack food you can choose? You know, probably not, and the reason why is because, um, first of all, a lot of the, the sweet potato converts very readily to sugar in the body. So essentially a lot of the chips that we eat, whether it's corn chips or rice chips or sweet potato chips, it's basically sugar because, you know, you have the more complex carb that quickly gets converted. And then you have the presence of the heat and the oil together with the carbohydrate. So you get the formation of a lot of other, well, different browning products that are not so healthful. So, you know, I'm kind of giving you a two-sided answer here. You know, on the list of different types of chips, is it one of the more more healthful ones? Yes, Um, especially the brands that don't have a lot added to it other than, like you said, just the simple oil and the vegetable, Um, whether it's a taro chip combined with sweet potato or a lot of different, you know. But I, I think it's deceiving to say that you get a serving of vegetables and to have that looked upon in the same way as something like one cup of steamed broccoli. I don't, in my mind, see them as equivalent. But they are a more healthful choice than something like, uh, you know, your standard white potato chip. So that's that's my kind of a take on that, kind of a balanced answer. What about the snap peas, the snap crisps? The snap crisps. Um You know, I think, again, uh, just to look at the starchy content, um, I have seen at uh, different grocery stores like the, the, um, the beans that have been dehydrated, but just note on a lot of those things that um, they are still more starchy. So it's not like a free food just because it looks like a vegetable. Um, when it's dried out like that, we tend to eat more, and they tend to be just more starchy in nature, so they may impact our blood sugar. So, again, is it a higher choice than maybe something like a white potato chip? Um, yes, potentially. Um, but, you know, the snap peas, I, I would say, you know, they're, they're not awful. They, they have certain nutrients that, that may be healthful. Um, but, again, I, I just think that, um, yeah, <laughs> I think it, it's about the balance and, again, shaking things up a, a little bit. I so uh, Vera is, is on the line, and, and she's saying snap peas have lots of omega-6. The thing with omega-6, though, is that um, typically in the standard American diet, we tend to get a lot of omega-6 already because people are doing a lot of processed oils like corn and soybean and sunflower and safflower. So we tend to be, um, yeah, the, the oil that they're using, exactly. So in general, um, Karen, I think your question is a good one. I think, um, again, it's it's a more balanced choice to make. Um, and, and so I wouldn't say that it's completely off limits. Just the only thing I also will say about that to close is that just make sure that what you're reading on the label that, um, you know, typically you see a lot of other things added, um, powdered cheese or salt or sugar. You'd be surprised um, at just even the sugar that's added to some of these chips. Um, and, of course, salt um, can be an issue for some people. But anyway, I, I don't think that they're terrible, and um, they may offer another option and a replacement for some of the the less healthful snacks. So thanks for mentioning that. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. All right. Let's see. I'll take one more question. I'm not sure if um, Sarah, let me just mute Karen there. And then Sarah, let's see if you had a question. I thought I saw your name. Maybe not. Okay. Anybody else? Oh, yeah, Sarah's there. Oh, Well, you were there. (laughs) There you are. Okay, I'm going to try to unmute you, Sarah. Okay, just a sec. 
Okay, this is unusual. For some reason, I'm not seeing you. Um, Sarah, what you may want to do is just type in your question because I don't see that you're on the phone line. So maybe I can get your question that way. So again, just one more um, question, comment before we close for this evening. Okay. All right. Well, again, um, for next week, we will have the final nutrition webinar in the series. And that um, will be on, you know, it's kind of going to be a very practical session of, you know, just food preparation, shopping list. How do you wrap your arms around all the stuff that we're talking about and just make it real? How do you walk into the grocery store, and um, I'll just share with you some of my own personal tips that I share with patients, and um, you know maybe we open that one up for much greater discussion because we will have that as kind of a summary session of all four, um, uh, actually all three, and then having that fourth one. So thank you all very much for your participation this evening. And um, as far as listening to this lecture, again, if you go to the Harmony Hill website, which is harmonyhill.org, you can get access to the audio and the video. So thank you very much, everybody, and have a great evening. I'll talk with you next week.